Mam Fatou Niang is a filmmaker and professor of French and Francophone studies at Carnegie Mellon University. Her work is on contemporary France, sub-Saharan Africa, post-colonialism, media studies and urban planning. Her documentary, Marie Noir, the subject in part of tonight's conversation, focuses on the Afro-French identities of seven women and was select selected for the San Francisco Black Fest Film Festival, Toronto Black Film Festival and Festival International de Film Black Montreal, among others. Mom, thank you so much for being with us this evening at the library. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and, you know, for your patience and, and passion for putting this together. I'm really excited to be here. It's a pleasure. Can we have a round of applause, please, to welcome Woo! Mom to the library this evening? And, and I'm saying hi to my students. <laughs> hi, guys. Hello, 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 American students. Okay, so we are going to um, stream the first section. Et finalement, j'ai commencé à observer comment les autres dansaient. Et c'était pareil. Je me disais, mais c'est quoi cette violence qu'on a envers nous-mêmes Et là, j'ai dit, waouh. Là, il y a vraiment un problème. Quoi. Je pense que c'est que un placebo de danser. Là, c'est que un placebo. C'est que quelque chose qui veut cacher un. Une plaie béante, quoi. Et là, j'ai dit, ouais, j'ai besoin, besoin de comprendre. Et tu penses d'où vient ce, ce rapport violent ben C'est ce, ce que j'essaye constamment de, de chercher. Je pense qu'elle est là, ma, ma recherche aujourd'hui. Et, euh, et je pense que c'est toute cette trajectoire qui est au-delà de mon histoire, qui est celle de mes parents, qui est celle de mes grands-parents, enfin, et qui fait que... Euh, que ouais, le besoin que j'ai aujourd'hui d'aller chercher dans l'époque coloniale, d'aller chercher dans, dans les... Euh... C'est long. Je pense que c'est assez complexe aujourd'hui encore de vivre avec tous tout ces mélanges parce que la France a encore du mal avec ses, ses ressortissants euh, noirs ou avec, on va dire, même de façon plus large, avec tous ces citoyens d'origine extra-européenne. Donc effectivement, on sent bien qu'on n'est pas totalement accepté et qu'il y a beaucoup de questions qui se posent à un niveau identitaire. Cette suppression de l'identité qui, qui a fait partie d'une certaine manière de, de mon éducation, enfin, de l'éducation que nos, nos parents nous ont donnée, je pense clairement que ça vient de l'histoire, hein, de l'histoire de mes parents qui sont arrivés en France à l'époque du Bumidum. Ils arrivent dans un environnement où la dominante ben, est, euh, est blanche, clairement, avec une culture française très, très marquée, etc. Ce sont les premiers à avoir expérimenté le racisme. Et du coup, ils ont dû, euh, ils ont dû en fait, euh, trouver des, euh, des, des parades, des, 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 des armes. Ils ont construit des armes pour pouvoir se protéger. Et une de, de ces, une, parmi les armes, on va dire, euh, c'est celle euh, a été celle de, de ne pas trop mettre en avant, en tout cas d'essayer de ne pas trop mettre en avant ses, ses spécificités. Euh, par exemple, ses cheveux afro, elle essayer de les, les attacher ou en tout cas les tirer au maximum en arrière ou les, les, les défriser littéralement. Ce n'est pas équilibrant pour une personne de vouloir masquer ou cacher euh, ce qui la définit. Ce n'est non. Et d'ailleurs, euh, très jeune. Euh, C'est quelque chose qui m'a toujours dérangée. Je suis allée à l'encontre de, euh, de, de cette suppression euh, identitaire <rire> totale. J'ai toujours été jusqu'au bout de ce que je voulais faire. Qu'on me dise oui, non, machin, si j'ai envie de le faire, je le fais. Ok. Thank you. So, so that's the beginning of the documentary. Uh, and, and mom, in the, in the kind of description of it online, and, and we can kind of see this here, 
um, you write that this documentary is a mosaic of seven narratives that raise the veil on a multicultural France. What does it mean to you to raise the veil or else you describe it as um, a kind of unraveling what it means to be black and French? So raising the veil for me, it's very important because right now there's a lot of narrative around, oh, we have to um, give voice to people who are voiceless. We, and the, nobody's voiceless. Right. So I kind of grew up with this idea that, um, I don't know, second generation or the first generation of migrants who were in France, of immigrants who were silenced. They kind of just were there, but nobody saw them. It's not true. My family has been here since the middle of the 19th century. <clears throat> and if I have trace of the culture that I had before we are here, it's because that culture was transmitted. So people are not voiceless. They have never been voiceless. It's just that the majority was not trained or willing to hear them. So for me, unveiling those stories is extremely important because they have always been here. And it also goes against this grain of saying, oh, you know, either this other France is invisible or it never existed mm -hmm. and it did exist. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very important because it's not, I mean, it's what Aline says, you are asked to kind of, because we have to conform to this ideal. You know, I teach in the US and I often have students who come to you know, Carnegie Mellon and they've taken French for years in high school and they've never seen in history books or in literature books or in French books, a mm. black person mm. or a woman with a veil mm. because the image of France is Amélie, right? Mm. Macaron, cheese, mm. the Champs-Élysées. So mm. this image of France and then once you're here, people might be like, okay, did the plane drop me in Bamako? I mean, am I in Paris, right? So this idea between the reality, and that's what Bintu was saying at the beginning, this kind of melancholia mm -hmm. and the, the gap between the story you write of yourself, the story that you tell the rest of the world, the story that you learn in school about yourself, this identity that you create that is molded and that is transmitted, and the reality of what you've always been and what you are and what you're in the process of becoming. And when those two collide, it's create what Gilroy called this postcolonial melancholia, right? And you often hear that. I remember, you know, January 6th in the US, this is not the America that I know, or in France, this is not, I mean, this is France, this is America. Ask people in Alexandria, this is America, right? So this gap between what you, you know, this narrative that you write about yourself, taking away bad parts or taking away the things that are not what you think you are, and then the reality of what you are and what happened when people who are that hidden reality comes and say, hey, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned Bintu, who, who we saw, and, and, and she describes how to live this experience, um, it's, it's kind of like living in a violent relationship with the society in which you live and in your own body. And this word violence comes up a lot throughout the documentary. It comes out a lot. And when I screened the movie, um, 2015, 16, 17, especially in the US, people will ask me, why does he use the word violence? I mean, it's super violent, yeah. especially in a country like France, where identity, you know, the constitution says that identity is one and indivisible. And for example, for years, I've been called one of the most racist person in France because I call myself Afro-French. Mm -hmm. And I'm hyphenating Frenchness, which is une et indivisible. I'm hyphenating with race which is not i mean it's not even something that you discuss and by doing that i'm copying you know african americanness and importing vision of race and identity from the us which is not what we have in france but the thing is you know i i often make the joke with my students I think that I may, I might be the person in Pittsburgh that give the most money <laughs> to the baker in my neighborhood. I have to eat my baguette, right, every day. I eat cheese, I can say it, I smuggle cheese, right? I have to eat my cheese, I'm the most Parisian person ever, but I eat yasa in my house and that comes from my family and it's been it has always been in my family there is this just part from senegal that seven generation in france could not erase mm -hmm. and listening to what mabula was saying yeah. we are we are born of 
parents that came from the Caribbean 150 years ago, 100 years ago, 60 years ago from the Caribbean and from Africa. And from that, we have a strength. But then, like Bintu was saying, when you go to Senegal, at one point, she was kind of sick of being here. And she had this like, oh, I'm, I'm African. I'm going back to Senegal. And the minute she got there, I mean, people look at you and they know you're not from here. And the word in Wolof for French is tubab, which means white. So in Senegal, I'm a white girl. Mm. I mean, the friend, I'm the white girl. Mm. And there's just so many things about how people react with you. You know that you're not from here, right. Right? right? So you are this, but not quite. And here in France, you're told that you're French. But at 13, I received the biggest whooping of my life because I went to basketball and my mom realized that I had forgotten my ID. Mm. And I have a very, very common name. It's like, you know, being called, I don't know, Michael Thomas in English. I have a very, very common Senegalese name. And this was the time when I was, uh, you know, 12, 13, where the whole like Chauvin Ma and, um, uh, you know, people, undocumented immigrants being sent back home. Right. So she was really scared that we'll be caught and then caught into, you know, just bureaucratic maze. And by the time we can prove who we are, we already, I don't know, in Mali or somewhere. So she really insisted, insisted that we walked around with our papers. And that, you know, when other people of your age who are white don't even have papers, it yeah. says something. Yeah. Also, the where are you from? So, I mean, I'm from the Obojolais. Yes, but where are you from? Mm -hmm. And really trying to understand where my blackness was from, right. because blackness is not part of being, you know, naturally French. So all of things make you understand really pretty soon that you're not, you're from here, but yeah. not quite. And I'm the part of the generation, just to finish yeah. on that really quickly, yeah. that you know, in the beginning of the 90s, we started hearing lyrics that kind of mirror the experience that we had growing up in ghettos. It was hip hop. And that right. explains why hip hop is, you know, French is the second country of hip hop. And so we identify to that. We also identify to Caribbeans. And, I, and to me, that's also how we kind of constructed Afro-Frenchness. Yeah. So a mix of Africa, a mix of the Caribbean, a mix of the United States, because the minute we had money and we were able to travel to the US, we realized that, ooh, being black in America mm, might not be, you know, what we thought, but it was also what helped us create our vision yes. of blackness yeah. and root that in France, absolutely. So taking all of that and, and you know, for us, that's what Afro-Frenchness is. Well, I was gonna ask you, do you feel at all American now that you've been there and taught there and? I've lived in America for 17 years yeah. and uh, I'm still French. Ooh, <laughs> I'm still French. I'm still struggling with, you know, like Pittsburgh food and stuff. Yeah, how, how, is the, how is the bakery in Pittsburgh? So, so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I played the fifth. I didn't say anything. I played the fifth, especially. So um, I'm, my mentor passed um, a few weeks ago, uh, Dr. Tyler Soval. And I'm finishing a piece that is called an Afro- French girl in in America, mm -hmm. which mirror his dissertation turned into a book, an African American in Paris, mm -hmm. and just talking about how this experience, you know, this transatlantic experience of blackness, how you know, traveling to Rio or being in New Orleans, in New York, you in Brussels, Paris, you have this experience of blackness that you can recognize because they have the same root, which is this, you know, very violent. Um, origin in the transatlantic slave trade. So there is absolutely an Atlantic, ex, you know, commonality in blackness, but then that commonality has, you know, its national differences. And in France, you cannot understand the experience of blackness without rooting it in the exceptionally, I don't want to say bizarre, but unique development of French identity, how French identity was, you know, molded from the 16th century to our days as this thing that, you know, has to be constructed around history and mm. language and mm. identité française, etc. Mm. So that makes it different from, you know, being black in Portugal or being black in Italy. Mm. So that really um, highlighted, you know, so I, I have an experience of blackness, but I think, and this sometimes is controversial when I say this in the US, 
But, um, and it's not a class thing. I think that really in the US, my nationality erased my blackness. And I've had experiences, for example, with the police that really made it clear that if I can be perceived as black, the minute I open my mouth and they hear my French accent, then I have to suffer through, you know, two to five minutes of bonjour, je veux aller à Paris. <laughs> it's, it happens. Horrible. <laughs> happens all the time right. where I think that the projection of that they have of France erases my blackness and and it makes for you know mm. funny experience in mm -hmm. the US mm -hmm. we're going to get back to this I'm very glad you mentioned your mentor because the next clip we're going to watch in fact the next two clips we're going to watch are kind of excerpts from the documentary where the seven women or several of them talk about the lack of re representation that they found growing up. So whether it's kind of a visual representation or in the case of Alice Diop, a more intellectual representation. So keep in mind that the documentary was, uh, this was in 2015. Yes, thank you. What do you think of the representation of women in France in France? Good question. In France? Yes. Quelle est la... Bah, je dirais à peu près aucune, en fait. Je n'ai pas le sentiment que la femme noire soit très représentée. Il euh, n'y a pas énormément de représentation de femmes noires euh, en France. Euh... Enfin, j ai, j ai, à part euh, Christiane Taubira, euh, si tu veux, je n'ai pas l'impression que... j'ai pas l'impression que, que j'existe euh, médiatiquement dans la... Dans la communauté nationale, en tout cas. On a des figures fortes, comme Christiane Taubira, par exemple, comme certaines journalistes, comme Audrey Pulvar, comme des sportives euh, voilà, de, de haut niveau. Maintenant, comment elle est représentée C'est une autre histoire. <rire> On met souvent en avant celle qui est quand même un peu claire, euh, un peu lissée, euh, qui se rapproche plus des canons de beauté dominants, toujours. Mais j'ai pas l'impression qu'il y ait aujourd'hui, en tout cas, un imaginaire très construit autour de la femme noire. Je pense qu'il se concentre davantage sur, euh, sur l'âme noire. Et qu'en revanche, peut-être, les, les, les images qu'on a euh, sont plus anciennes, viennent de temps plus anciens, euh, je dirais sans doute des temps euh, coloniaux, de cette idée effectivement du corps offert. Euh, de la lascivité, de la sexualité. Quand j'étais petite, j'avais pas vraiment de modèle, euh, euh, modèle bien précis. C'est plus tard en, en grandissant que j'ai commencé à avoir des modèles euh, africains, euh, des femmes comme euh, Ali Berry, euh, des femmes comme euh, euh, Whoopi Goldberg. La, la femme noire française, en tout cas, c'est le mystère. Alors, euh, tu es, es dans une, un océan de stéréotypes. Euh, je sais pas, moi, tu as la mama africaine, euh, tu vois. Euh, tu as le fantasme, euh, je sais pas, moi, des afro-américaines. Tu sais, euh, alors, on a des Beyoncé, des Rihanna, des Nicki Minaj, enfin voilà, des femmes sexy, mais, euh, mais aussi sexy, désirable, parce que américaine. Parce que il n'y a pas d'équivalent. Il y a pas, ça, ça, pour moi, ça fait aussi partie du, de l'attrait que, qu les, que les États-Unis exercent sur la France. Donc, elles, elles sont, elles sont aussi, c'est la nationalité qui compte. Et après, la femme française, je ne sais pas, c'est qui la femme française Déjà, pour, pour la voir, la femme noire française, c'est qui Il y a une invisibilité, mais qui est criante, qui est incroyable. Dans les médias, dans la vie de tous les jours, les gens ne veulent pas t'ancrer en France. Les gens demandent tout le temps d'où tu viens. So now we're going to go to the uh, intellectual representation. Um, Quand j'étais en licence, je me suis vachement questionnée sur mon identité. Je me suis, je me suis aperçue que jusqu'à présent, il n'y avait aucun modèle de référence. Euh de penseurs, d'auteurs, de, d'écrivains euh, euh, africains. J'en connaissais absolument aucun. Il 
Et tout d'un coup, je me suis dit, mais en fait, c'est comme si j'avais grandi avec l'idée que être adulte, c'était forcément être blanc. Et que tu vois, j'avais pas de modèle de référence pour me projeter moi en tant qu'adulte. Et c'est arrivé à 23 ans que tu vois, cette question m'a. Tu vois, elle m'est tombée dessus, quoi. Je me dis, mais en fait, mais. Ah ouais. Euh... Donc j'ai découvert Saint-Gore, tu vois, j'ai découvert Aimé Césaire, j'ai lu leurs textes et j'ai été complètement bouleversée. Je me suis dit, mais toi, tout d'un coup, il m'apparaissait un modèle d'identification. Donc voilà, donc à la fois ça a été structuré et en même temps je me suis positionnée par rapport à ça aussi. Et ça, ça a été... Euh, donc finalement ça m'a permis de me fonder, mais ça m'a permis aussi de m'interroger sur qu'est-ce que c'est, qu'est-ce que c'est, qu'est-ce que je suis, qui suis-je au-delà de ça. Um, so here, so we saw two clips, uh, one kind of talking about the lack of, of visible representation of women, um, kind of for these women growing up, I imagine for you as well, and also the, the intellectual absence. Can you speak to this and can you also please speak to how it's felt for you to now be one of these women that young black French women are looking up to? Wow. So w when I watched this, this was six years ago. I just realized how far we've come yeah. in six years. But at the same time, we're starting from so far that even the nothing that we have now seems like a lot and we have nothing right now. So in the past like days, I've been contacted by major, you know, news outlet. Like the last one was Telerama this morning. And every time I check, the woman who contacts me has, I can tell from her name that she's black or she's Arab. So it takes someone like us to be in these places, Le Figaro, Liberation, Telerama, for our vision of the world to interest them. There's also an audience thing, right? Because we used to, to hear that, oh, these things don't interest people. We had Le Model Noir, you know, all the events that we can do, I don't know, at Pompidou, or people want to know what's happening, right? Because they're hearing that the wokes are coming to get friends. They want to know who the works are before we get them, right? So people come to these events. But so I realize the, the, everything that's been done in the past six years, as far as moving this representation. And I, I try to shy away from political representation because not all good representation is good representation, but you know, there's a moment where we need people there. And what, what Ali say is very important, both at the personal and the international in, at the, and the intellectual level, because I mean, I was this little girl, you know, that she's talking about who grew up thinking that to be an adult is to be white because growing up in an Afro-French family, the representation of, that you have of Africa in the 80s and the 90s, it's the bag of rice that needs to be sent to Ethiopia. When we see Africa, it's, you know, the wars, Shaka Zulu, the cannibals, etc. This is the image of Africa. And Africans in France, um, you know, it's the polygamous dad who's trying to swindle the French state. It's the terrorists, etc. So the image was not, and you know, when you're eight or nine, you don't, you're not trying to look at the empires. You want to see who's next to you and what is being said of people who look like you. And it was not great, right? So, did, and, and who did you look up to? I mean, I, I remember, you know, this was in the 90s. We remember that French people like we realized that French people like black people but black Americans the first black doctors that we all knew was Dr. Uxtable right and they loved the Michaels Michael Jordan Michael Jackson so it also explained why we we, we liked American culture and it also there's something also about this love of blackness when it's Americanness, which is also very different, right? This the Baldwin, there's a reason why, you know, the James Baldwin, and we can also talk about that. So I was the little girl who, who lied. You know, I was a really, really good student because I didn't want my mom to come to school to get my my grades because my mom was she's even taller than me she likes you know this outlandish african fabrics and to me a mom was what i've what i will see in ads you know during the club dorothy she's tiny she's white she's blonde and she has a spotless kitchen and i'm sure that her kitchen doesn't smell of all the spices that my mom smell of when she walked so there was all this thing what is a mom to me a mom was white because I didn't grow up seeing a mom who looked like mine on TV or something even similar. And on the intellectual level, um, you know, I, I was an architecture student arriving in the US for nine months exchange program that was going to change my life at Brown. And we were a group of six French students. We took this class with Dr. Trika Rose. It was a class on African literature. And on the first day, it was this was, August 28, 2006, she told us, okay, we are happy to have French students here. She addressed the class. 
you know, we were looking at the syllabus and just say, when we arrived on the part on French taught post-colonialism, I had never heard the word before. And Fanon, we want the French student to intervene. And we were like, yeah, I had no idea who Fanon was. So it was in that class in Providence, Rhode Island in 2006, that for the first time I heard the word Marie Scondé, Césaire, Fanon, that I discovered these people that my American counterpart has been studying for the past two, three years. And it says something to see people who look like you, who wrote 60 years before, things that you've been thinking in your room and thought you were crazy because these things are not where you were told that knowledge is in the school books, in statues, in names of streets, everything that creates a sense of unity everything that creates a sense of us, everything in France that creates a sense of identity, our past, the love that we have our past, the love, the way our past explains our presence and give us the energy to jump in our future. I was in none of that. And that explains why people kept asking me, where are you from? What do you do here, right? And so, and you realize that people have been writing about that in the, the history, you know, the more, I start looking into that. How can we talk of France without addressing Haiti and saint omer It's absolutely impossible to have a history of France that doesn't, of the French Republic that doesn't start with saint omer So opening, and again, it goes back to this idea of unveiling, not creating anything, not taking away, because sometimes we are accused of, you know, canceling. We want to cancel French culture or we want to add things. We're not adding pages. We're not removing. We just realized that some pages were glued, that this whole time, I, this is something that you know I've told my student last week, we've been reading this amazing national narrative. And then all of a sudden, there's a little kid who say, Jesus Christ, we just jumped from page two to six. Nobody noticed, right? We've been doing this for 400 years. Now we're going to have to patiently unglue and read page three and four and know who Delcrest was and know what happened in Saint-Domingue and know why are black people and Arabs living in, and because all these things just did not happen and all these things didn't happen because these people are naturally bad and they just found themselves in HLM, all these things just don't happen. There is a reason and this reason it's here. It's in the archives, it's, it's in my body, it's in France, it's here. We just have to learn how to listen to these things. We just have to, learn how to see these things because they are here and they are not imported from America. It's such a lovely metaphor, this idea of a book with pages glued together. Absolutely. I've not heard that. Absolutely. Nothing is being added, nothing is being taken away. We're just ungluing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to, I, I do want to bring in your fantastic um, essay or and book, Universalism. And so I'm going to try and fold it in now. Don't give too many information because students will oh. be tested on this in two weeks. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, I'm taking notes. I wish I was your student. You seem kidding. to be very close. Um, no, but also, I, I it, it, as you say, this, this is a kind of an outdated in the sense that it was it was uh, from 2015, 2016, so about six years ago now. And um, it seems to me that in some ways representation can also be a double bind in the sense that in the book you mention um, Josephine Baker and the Reese and, and her kind of being put in the in the Pantheon and you write in the sixth kind of chapter or essay, which is called in English, I did this is my translation, so please. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a brilliant English translation. The sixth essay is called um, Keeping a Grip on the National Story, and you write, politically, isn't the putting uh, in the pantheon of Josephine Baker in November 2021 intended to make people forget all these absences by turning her mortal remains into proof that racism has no history in France? In other words, so some representation can actually efface um, the kind of history underneath. Absolutely. And this is a very sensitive topic because we, it, it really has to be, I mean, we really understand that we're not, it's, it's, and we have to be actually careful that pitting one blackness against another, right? And from, and I really, I was really excited actually when this happened, because I think that many of the Afro-French people, writers who spoke, um, on this, not against this, on this, spoke really intelligently. Nobody, uh, you know, complain about Josephine Baker being there. I mean, she, I, I mean, my girl deserved being there. I was in New York, you know, for celebrating. We had fun and we drank for her, right? She deserved <laughs> being there. But the thing is, it, it really 
it, it brought us back to um, two years ago during the big manifestation that followed um, the death of George Floyd mm -hmm. in France. Mm -hmm. So here we have a black man killed by police and his last words were, I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. We have a kid killed by police, a black man killed by police whose last words were, I can't breathe and whose sister has been trying for the past last years to prove to have the state explain to her how her brother died that's Adama Traoré mm -hmm. and we are invited on TV I'm talking about Mabula me and to told by producers we are here to talk about George Floyd and if you remember yeah. George Floyd's death the coverage of George Floyd's death in France dwarfed COVID and here we are coming out of you know the first round of um, uh, confinement and the death of George Floyd is dwarfing the coverage of COVID in France. And, you know, then we just back to these words, les fantômes de l'Amérique, the ghost of America, America will never be cured of its racism and racism, especially anti-blackness, it's America, the French media got that. So I'm inviting on French TV and the producers will tell us in advance, we're here to talk about George Floyd and you're like, okay. And you talk about Adama because mm. to understand how George Floyd's death is related to racism and to blackness and not be able to make the case here, mm. that's one thing. And once you know, once they realized that it was impossible not to make the the, the connection, mm. especially after tens of thousands of people being out in Bordeaux, Lyon, mm. asking justice. I mean, mm. if you can see anti-blackness in Brazil, you can see it in South America, in South Africa, you can see it in the US. What's happening in France? And so what, is, what is happening? What's ha and yeah. with you not being able to see it? And this is where this kind of Republican dam, we don't talk about race. We don't address it. We don't anchor it. We don't yeah. even anchor it. But, I mean, we're still looking for a word to say blackness, mm. right? Noirete, noirete, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So this is where the, the dam kind of broke and the conversation started in the media, but it started in an extremely interesting way with media pundits saying anti-blackness cannot, I mean, France cannot be accused of anti-blackness and the example being all over, I mean, we studied this with my student being plastered all over was, of course, after all, we are the country that welcomed, you know, like the Harlem Renaissance and all these examples coming over and over, which are right, James Baldwin. And this idea, and I mean, I remember this, this interview where Mabula is talking to a journalist who say anti-blackness cannot exist in France. We are the country where Miles Davis was able to date one of the cutest girl around, Juliette Greco. <laughs> this is the country where GIs could have, you know, white girlfriends. And, and this is the time where they're in Barack that are where they are colored they can't be with white soldiers so just using this american example as an an example that anti-blackness cannot be and we've seen this in the mouth of macron mm -hmm. and blanquer so really literally our ex experience is being erased when at the same time just read the stone face African Americans are here and they are right having lots of fun in Saint Germain des Prés, but some of them are looking at the African blacks and saying, What's up with them? And then people are like, No worries, they are okay. So, really, this experience and it brings me back to this idea anchoring blackness in a nationality. What's happening to the blacks of the people where you go? Because if I take my experience as a black French person in America, as indicative of what blackness is in America, any African-American who will come and tell me that there is problem in America, I'll be like, no, I'm having such a fun time in America. Mm -hmm. America, I mean, where do you see anti-blackness? Mm -hmm. So who's black are you? Yeah. Who's black are you? Mm -hmm. And what are the endemic situation with mm -hmm. black people in the country where you are? Mm -hmm. And how your blackness can be, I mean, I see it. I'm, I'm, I'm really open with that how many, the, the scholarship that I had as a doctoral student was created 18 years before I arrived at Louisiana State University. It was to enable, um, you know, to help the development of African-American st students, PhD students. I was the 18 non-American black students who have it. All of the recipients have been from the Caribbeans or black Europeans. Mm -hmm. Same thing with most of the scholarships or grant that I receive because I study blackness and race, but 
in France. And it's sometimes, you know, somehow it helps America feel less bad about mm -hmm. its own issues because my work is pointing at another country mm -hmm. and France is doing that. So yeah. what we have to do is really, and this is why it's very yeah. important for us to cross fertilize your, my, your, our research. Yeah. I work with researchers in Brazil, in the US, and by doing this, mm -hmm. it becomes impossible for our countries to point the finger because wherever you point the finger, somebody is already waiting for you and say, yes, but my research is showing that yeah. and you know kind of yeah. close this yeah. yeah this game of hide and seek that people are doing you know our countries the the black Atlant in the black atlantic by always having a telescope on the other country's messy garden oh brazil the u.s who and what we do with our research and really by creating this consortia is shortening the lens of the telescope and making it a mirror oh america oh <gasps> That's me. Yeah. yeah, it's you, France. It's you, Brazil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really glad um, you talked about your research because the next clip we're going to watch is of Mabula, um, your colleague here in France, who's talking about her relationship between her academia and her kind of interventions as a public intellectual. Moi, je me considère pas comme une une militante. C'est-à-dire que c'est un terme qu'on dont on m'affuble souvent et contre lequel je n'ai rien du tout. Mais je, je décèle quand même ce qui peut apparaître derrière l'utilisation de ce terme. Donc souvent, puisque mon statut euh, administratif, euh, c'est euh, enseignant-chercheur. Euh, donc si tu, tu qualifies un enseignant-chercheur de militant, c'est-à-dire que tu parles de quelqu'un qui n'est pas, on va dire, à la pointe de son métier, quelqu'un qui est trop passionné, quelqu'un qui n'est pas objectif. Donc je trouve que des fois l'utilisation de, 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 du terme militant, euh, elle, elle, elle sert à disqualifier euh, ta, ta légitimité. Donc des fois, j'aime pas ça. Maintenant, j'ai conscience que j'ai un parti pris, euh, euh, on va dire, intellectuel, euh, peut-être philosophique, et que le, qui est que le fait d'étudier des, des Noirs, déjà, c'est déjà un acte politique. Voilà, pour moi, je, je m'intéresse aux personnes dont on ne parle pas. Je, je m'intéresse aux, aux, oui, aux démunis, aux exclus, aux marginaux, aux, aux perdants, aux, aux pauvres, euh, aux banlieusards. Enfin, voilà, les, les gens, ils se trouvent et, euh, dans cette grande catégorie noire qui est un peu est nébuleuse. Mais est ce qui, donc, avoir décidé de faire une thèse sur ça et avoir décidé de, de travailler sur ça, bah, on sait très bien que ce n'est pas pour les... Euh, c'est pas pour atteindre la gloire dans l'université française. C'est pas voilà, c'est pas toi qui aura les meilleurs postes, les meilleurs crédits, les meilleurs euh, voilà. C'est un peu se tirer une balle dans le pied, mais euh, mais c'est le seul travail qui, qui compte. Um, so the, I suppose my question for you is that have you kind of received similar uh, <laughs> critiques um, in the sense of being called kind of passionate, militant, and and do you feel that it is in some ways a kind of attack? on your legitimacy as an academic? And then also, do you think that your academic career would have been different if you had stayed in France? Okay. Oh my God, Absol <laughs> absolutely, wow. So when I returned from the nine months program at Brown and decided to switch from- um, Architecture. You know, okay, <laughs> and I was doing really good to studying the blacks. Um, the response of the university was very interesting here um, with the, the responsible of the program. Uh, telling me that I couldn't do that. And I don't know, I was, I'm very, je, je persévère. So I was asking why um, I was going to work on Marie Scondé and, and she's a, you know, and it's very interesting at the time because the word black can't come out. You know, we have a problem. It's getting better, but we have a problem to say la femme noire or une femme noire. So basically I couldn't work on her because she's a black woman and and I'm a black woman. So there's the issue of objectivity and, and also working on the banlieue because they are my people. And I remember saying, I mean, if we are all French, they are your people too, right? He was an old white man. If we are all French, they are your people too. And, and also, he was working, he doing like he was a specialist of Shakespeare. I mean, Shakespeare is nobody ever asked you not to work on Shakespeare because he was a you know a white man like you. So what what makes me what makes it impossible? And what I do with my research is that I try to address simple questions like 
how do you create subjectivity? How do you create identity when you are French and you know Caribbean, French and African? But I also try you know to look at the bigger questions around how do we create knowledge and how do who who when how did we come to decide that whatever knowledge I was going to create with this project was not knowledge, or that if it was knowledge, it was not mine to create. My being too close on the subject makes me makes it impossible for me to become the creator of this knowledge. Then at this point, I could only be called a militant. And I'm just like, but then if you work on Shakespeare and you look like Shakespeare, then you, are you a militant of Shakespeare? Anyways, so, <laughs> and if, would my career be different if I had stayed in France? Absolutely, because I would have not have a career. Absolutely. So I'm part of a generation of, um, we are 50-ish right now in most of us in the US too in Canada, a generation of French um, scholars in the US. We are now, we're not going to say our age, but all associate professors. And most of us left between uh, 2002 and 2008. This is the Sarkozy years. Yeah. France, you love it or you leave it. La France, tu l'aimes ou tu la quittes. For me, the relationship was complicated, I left. Mm -hmm. And it would have absolutely been impossible to do our research for the simple reason that ethnic studies department don't exist here. Race is not something that you can study. And most of the people that you know now who studied in France, I'm thinking Audrey Celestine, Cyliane Larcher, Maboula Soumoro, Papnjai, mm -hmm. who do work on Black France, all have degrees in English. Mm -hmm. So the only place where in France you could do that is to study African-American and the plights of African-American in America and use that as a kind of detour. But studying um, in many departments until today, Marie Condé is taught as a Francophone author. So she's taught outside of the canon of what French literature is, which is white literature. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, we know that you know people like Milan Kundera who were not born French are considered French author. So these are all the questions that I, that I look for in my research, who, who, how do we become French? Who can be a French writer, a French actor, a French filmmaker, right? What are the words that we use to say us, to, mm. to, you know, to say them without even having to, re to use the word color, right, mm. race? And um, yeah, my career would have been absolutely different because all of us now, we teach in the US and we are able to do the research that we do on France. I'm thinking, you know, Félix Germain, uh, uh, Grégory Pierrot, Jacqueline Couty, all of us, we left as exchange students yeah. and arriving in a country where we realized that, whoa, <laughs> you know, what's up? I mean, just, and I'm going to link this to the question about being a militant. I had, I was first prize in history, most of uh, middle school and, and high school. And I didn't know that Saint-Domingue was Haiti. And I didn't know that Saint-Domingue was the richest colony. I just didn't, it was nowhere in my history books. Uh, first prize in French, I never learned about Marie Condé. So mm. what does it say about the history that we learn? And to, really wanting, and, and we're talking about elements that are not small, that are not, I mean, Saint-Domingue was the richest colony of the world. How, what France would have been without Saint-Domingue? So how do you erase that history and still create something that stands? How do you talk about French literature and not include all these writers from Western Africa and, and the Indian Ocean and Oceania? What does it say about French literature? And be, and we are called militant because we are trying to raise questions that some of the biggest mind and the, the most intelligent minds, I'm talking politicians, uh, you know, the, 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 even the kings at the end of the monarchy and absolutely the, the, the terrorist and architect of the, revol of the Republic told us that, you know, and I'm quoting here Renaud, that amnesia was the glue of the nation. The, one of the worst thing that could happen for the nation is the development of history. We have to learn to forget, which I understand because if we remember how we got into a family, I mean, I'm just thinking about my own family. My sister and I would ever talk about ourselves. I mean, just the fightings that we did when we were young. So you have to forget so we can you know, remember and be one around what makes the most important things. But it just happened that in our family, all the things that explain why I am here, like I'm talking about friends' family, 
are inexistent. And actually, I'm not in the family photo. <laughs> I'm not in the family album. So people keep asking me who you are. Are you in our family? How long you've been here? Because I'm this. So you call militant because you're raising things that we were, you know, told that these ghosts should remain. Yeah. You know, hidden forever. And yeah, they can't. It, it occurs to me um, that you may be called militant. And you may also be called woke or wokeism. And this will be my final question. And unfortunately, we don't have time to do any more screening because I really want to get to the questions in the audience and, and hear from, from all of you. But so I'll kind of um, just describe briefly the clip, which is this is Isabel uh, Bonny Clavery, who's a filmmaker, screenwriter, and author. And she's basically saying that uh, back in kind of 2015. 16 that this is a moment of the redefinition of French identity and she describes that this moment is kind of shrouded in a lot of fear and so the question of course is where does the fear come from um, and so I wanted to uh, quote you um, in, in your book Universalism when you talk about I think where some of this fear is coming from you describe um, in the essay pseudo-universalist strength you write we make the hypothesis here that what pseudo-universalists call uh, universalism is neither a value nor a principle nor a concept. It's a doctrinal weapon that has been assigned three main functions. One, to repress the history of French colonialism. Two, to control the national novel. And three, to present racism as a distant, foreign, obsolete object without any, re any reality or actuality in today's France. Can you talk a little bit about wokeism as it relates to universalism? And then we will turn to the audience. So I've been invited a lot on French TV radio to talk about wokeism. I've only been once because I thought that it was, you know, there was, I could, I don't watch a lot of TV, but the one or, you know, two times I watch a sometimes very serious shows on wokeism or woke I had no idea what they were talking about and really this idea that what what's happening I mean what are, are these people saying so I went to France Culture it was the only um I, I, I heard this yeah that yeah, I yeah. did because it was really I mean what are we talking about what's happening is this France I mean what is this Bourbier Marécage we have no idea what is what so I went there to say that once I have no idea what wokeism is and whoever is using it I mean it's like who's she said to I have no idea what it is, but I know why it's being used. Mm. So it's really to, again, to talk about this idea of militant. You're not mm. a real researcher. You are militant. Mm. I mean, we are all militant. Mm. Identity politics, we live just, I mean, I'm not even talking about the US or, or Canada or Germany, but we live in a country that really, il y a eu un travail de dentelle qui a été fait autour de l'identité nationale. This really finely tuned, created this idea around language. Parler français, c'est être français. From the Sermon de Villers-Cotterêts to all the people who were killed during the uh, industry, the linguistic terror to um, l'Académie Française, les lois tout bon, and I'm just talking about language here, how all this idea was created with all this appareil d'état, the museum, the role of culture. So a country that finally tuned its idea of itself, its idea, right, of itself, but completely becomes mum or dumb when other people want to do that. Yeah. So really decide that everybody doubles in identity politics, but then the, it's really whose identity politics is acceptable and whose is militant, dangerous, that needs to be erased, controlled, etc. So that's my, my first thing. And the second, um, to talk about wokeism, and to me, we're often accused of, you know, wanting to cancel, wanting to erase, wanting to destroy. And last year, during the whole islamo yeah. uh, you know, ruckus, Blanquer said that the republic, universalism should be protected from the wokes who were sent by America with nukes, you know, to come and nuke France and who? And Macron said yeah. that we were here to break the republic in two. Yeah. And it's really this idea of, you know, we've created this growl and the growl now is sanctified, it's sedimentized, and we have to now come together and, and saved it from the hordes mm. and my, and when you look at universalism it's a project mm. from day one it's a project and really can we just take a moment and think about was it ever real mm. i mean from the day from day one of its being implemented women couldn't vote mm. women couldn't own properties mm. 
black people were slaves um, in the, I don't know, like in the colonies in the Maghreb, Muslims, by virtue of being Muslims, because with Le Code de l'Indigena, were second class citizen. Um, poor people couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. So when was universalism fully realized? Right. And for all these things, for all these false and bad things to be right, people had to come and say, I'm going to point this bad thing. And this is what we are doing by saying, I think that I'm sorry, America, but we have the best model of Republic alive possible. Mm -hmm. This universalism can work, but it needs to be to happen in reality. We mm -hmm. can't just say liberté, égalité, fraternité and have this like magical thing with words. If I say liberté, we are, we are not there. Mm -hmm. Freedom is not total for everybody. Mm -hmm. Égalité is not here, absolutely fraternité. So we have to keep working and, and keep working by anchoring these ideals to the society that we have now today and not Napoleon's or I don't know whoever like Renan or even Blanquer's you know the passé mm -hmm. idea of France mm -hmm. so keep this and this is how universalism become real when we accept that it's a project when and when we accept that it's something that has to be anchored to the society where we live la réalité qu'on a mm -hmm. and also the people who are here mm -hmm. so universalism can't be just this abstract idea and this abstract idea that also you know, I'm often asked, why do you want to bring race? Because when you dismantle the computer that is France and the way we created, we coded the Republic, the mother card was race. Mm. The mother, I mean, just read uh, L'Autre Citoyen, Siliane Larcher, our conception of citizenship was made with the mirror of who was not a citizen. So something that was encoded in how we understand each other we can't just wake up and say okay guys we know that we did something really bad by creating this race thing and it brought slavery and the holocaust okay but then let's oh we'll take care of it let's just take the word away post-racial society no you can't have a post-racial society by removing the word race we have to go and dismantle the thing again see where the card was inserted and remove it and that for that to happen, we have to accept that the card is here and this is what we want to do and we don't want to do. I don't want a post-racial society, I want a post-racist society and that can't happen without one realizing that the card is here, without realizing the computer could not work without the card being here and then see together how we can remove the card mm -hmm. and that card is race. Mm -hmm. And in your essay, you cited um, Papni, uh, Nian Dai, who we had here at the beginning um, of the month, and 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 you wrote, uh, kind of paraphrasing him, how can we ensure that universalism, as he says, is valid for everyone? Is valid for everyone, exactly. Right. Can we have a big round of applause, please, for me? <laughs> I wish we had a whole other hour. Um, are there any questions in the room? I'm a teacher. If you don't ask questions, I'll just go. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. I like your hair. Thank you. Bonsoir, ma'am. Hello. Um, ma'am, I'm that's very, my tweet. I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to be here tonight. I uh, have been following your work for years and everything that you share was so brilliant. And I have been following everything that you have been doing online. I'm doing, um, it's funny because the, 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 the little, uh, few minutes that Mabula was sharing, I kind of read the same thing on her book, The Triangle de l'Hexagone. Mm -hmm. And all the work that we are doing, so I'm the founder of Lola Africa, and we are doing that kind of job in the travel and, and cultural, you know, uh, length. And I have a, my question for you is that um, for the last years, I have seen, you know, kind of a, a rising of all these questions on the public space and we have been seeing, and just like you said, we see some improvement, but it's just so little. Mm -hmm. um, and now I found myself in a situation where I see some figures of representation like you, like Mabula, like Rukaya and many more. Uh, and I also see the way you're being attacked so violently uh, on the media. And as an entrepreneur working on that, uh, that land, it really, it really becomes scary as a black woman um, to be, to be working on those topics uh, in France. I mean, because in the U.S. it's really being embraced. 
Um, so what will be your advice for all this generation uh, that I am part of, of entrepreneur who are really working, whatever it's in politics, business, academic, uh, picking uh, by choice those topics because we are concerned, we are passionate about it. How do you face all this violence? Because it's really violence. It's traumatizing when just you see it. So I cannot put myself in your shoes, but it's really violent and it's caring. So what will be your advice? Because at some point I see a lot of friends moving from France, like it always has been in France, has always lost the cerveau. Uh, I don't know how to say it in, in French. Brain drain. Yeah. Um, and we are a lot being, yeah, thinking a lot about it because at some point it's just, and I think for my generation, it's just like, we don't want to get too um, épuisé. Uh, and at some point, we don't want to lose too many years and just leave and go somewhere else. So what will be your advice on that? Oh, my God, that's a, that's a do we have another hour? This is a, <laughs> a dope, dope, dope question, like fatigue. How do you deal with the fatigue of just having to say I am like not I am, but like I really am. I'm not. So, you know, it's it's. The, the first function of racism is distraction, right? So someone say you have three eyes and you have to go, oh no, I mean, I can go to the faculty of medicine and bring something that says black people have only two. And you try to give a honest and something intelligent and something that is argumented to something that doesn't make sense. And by the time you bring your old dossiers showing that you have two eyes, they've shifted to the fact that you have three navels. And, all the, and while you're doing that, always answering to these people, reacting, you're not creating. And not just you're not creating, because not all of us have to be creators, but you, you are not, you are not. I mean, this is also something, sometimes you just want to be, you just want to hang out and not just be. You don't have to prove, you don't have to create, you don't, you just want and say, I am and I'm whatever I am. So the fatigue is here. And, and what you say about, you know, the attack last, two, the past two years were very violent, especially following, you know, my denunciation of the Assemblée Nationale Fresco, where it doesn't make sense. I mean, that thing, I look at it and it just, it's so ridiculous. It does not make sense. And it's that in that space of it doesn't make sense that you find actually optimism because it's so ridiculous, it can only fail. I mean, I don't know if you can show the fresco. It's so crazy. So this is where... There was a really good article in the New York Times on the brain drain, actually saying, that, you know, showing how generations of Black, Arab, Muslims, writers, artists, thinkers, students are leaving France because of this fatigue of wanting to be just, you know, setting. And people are very aware of the racism or difficulties of these places. I live in the U.S. for 17 years. I can't wait to be back. I'm here every three weeks because I miss here. This is my home. And you want to be, and I want to be in a place where my sister won't have to leave. I, my daughter won't have to leave because this is home. Whether home recognizes us as daughters or sons, this is home. And how do we, where do I get the optimism? Because the situation doesn't make sense. And what I see now, like you say, the situation is being addressed. It's been, we see all these new initiatives, le sensé, la diversité, et cetera because we've come to a point where it can't be hidden. The worst thing is when people don't pay attention to what you're asking, right? And now when Macron comes on TV and say, oh, c'est pas, even if it's in bad terms, he's still addressing. And it's in sharp contrast with this is not worth being addressed. So they understand that it's a question now and we need to take that into consideration and, and put the actors that we want in order to control the situation, but it's uncontrollable. I mean, look at Asa Traoré, she is uncontrollable, right? And it's really, to me, this, the, the, it might be a, a individual uh, thing, but I see this, this huge movement or global movement or even French movement as the, the cemetery of the elephants. In Africa, we say, you know, there's this thing with Amok, when elephant dies, they go Amok. They, you know, raise lots of dust and it, the ground is moving and you can't even see in front of you and you think it's the end of the world, but it's there and eventually they'll fall to the ground. And that's, I might be too optimistic because I don't know, maybe next week we'll be nuked by Russians. I don't know. <laughs> but, 
but I want to think that, you know, that it's the end of their world and it's the end of something that was so finely tuned to be hidden, but it was too fragile. It's impossible to hide all this. It could, it was possible for, I have, it's a miracle for me that all these things were hidden for so long. I mean, when you go into archives and that's the, also the beauty with France, everything is in the archives. I'm like, guys, you did a really bad job hiding this crime. Everything is here. I'm so jealous of my students who are starting doctoral thesis because there's a, the amount of topics and every, I should not say that because they'll start burning the archives, but the amount and the crimes and guys, you guys didn't hide anything right so it's here and once all these things start coming at the surface the system will have to change so how it changed the way you know it's really going back to this idea of post-colonial melancholy the violence of the confrontation between how you were able to rule right the narrative and the narrative coming out of your belly and you know when you want to puke you have to puke you can't keep it hot, like your body will have to bring it. And that's what's happening with France where all these things that were kept inside, this bad stuff, it's coming. And we are trying to keep it from not coming out, but eventually it will come out and you better just accept it and vomit. You feel better after. <laughs> Thank you. So any more questions? Yes. I'll, I'll try to give really short answers. Okay, okay. Okay. Um... Hi, this is the first time I've commented in any kind of a forum like this. It's oh, more... you could you woo! <laughs> yeah, you. Um, it's more. It's comment and a question. Um, uh, just a little bit of my own story. Uh, I'm American. I'm from New York, um, but my family is Gambian. I'm a dual citizen, mm -hmm. so it's interesting for me to be American in Paris, but also to be. African, but from an Anglophone country, mm -hmm. uh, one that is surrounded by a Francophone country and has deep history with it, and is only separated because of Absolutely. Because the French the, and the British. Yeah, the UK needed a share of, of the course. Atlantic Ocean. Um, the, question, the question I have relates to a conversation that I had with a friend who herself is half Portuguese, half Ivorian, grew up on the continent for a little bit, and then moved to France with her mother. And I asked her one day, what do the kids learn, and I'll say this in French, about l'histoire grand H. What do they learn about themselves in l'histoire grand H de la France? And specifically, I was asking about black, black students or Arab students. And that we were having this conversation probably after some kind of, some kind of racist event happened. And I said to her, it doesn't shock me that there's, we're always having these conversations about it, well, in France, about the kids or the people issue de l'immigration, which is a ridiculous term itself for me, mm -hmm. um, because of course there's an identity issue. You're reading books, you're learning, but you're never learning about anything that has to do really with you. So how can you place yourself in the national story? But it's not a question of, are they even there? For me, what I understand is that all of this, as we've just said, is in the National Archives, it's all documented. So my question is, given that the French education system is really the system that forms French people, really, le lycée, avoir le baccalauréat. Le, pro le programme. <laughs> le programme, le, le parcours. What does this mean and how can it, how can it change? I mean, there are, there are things, th these documents are out here. What do the kids learn about the Haitian revolution? What do they learn about the, the fact that, uh, that you know, Haiti literally paid, was paying France for its own freedom, that money helped them in the French war effort. Haitian people paying in the blood of their ancestors funded France, but you don't learn it like that. Right, mm -hmm. and this is just one example, but I'll I'll let you answer the question. But it's really a it's a global question. No, it's a, it's a global it's a global question, and we see. I mean, in in, in the U.S., uh, I, I was just signing a letter for colleagues, um, in Texas, you know, who are in universities and who are not sure that they can teach that course tomorrow, you know, because of the whole apply about critical race theory. But in France, it's not, it, it says something where, you know, the chef de file of this movement are 
in education. I mean, we've seen Vidal, who's kind of a ghost, but she is, when she comes out of her, you know, whatever places she's embalmed, it's to say, you know, things about, you know, l'islamo-gauchisme qui gangrène l'université, or Blanquer with school. It's very weird. I mean, he's really one of the têtes de pont of this whole um, fight against. And it's, it's normal because it's education. Education is taught to be, it's called le moule républicain. This is where it doesn't matter if you are, I will always tell, show my students this thing, you know, like a processing plant and you have one blue rectangle, one red circle, shapes, different shapes, they get through school and you have same stick, right? They are both the, the Republican elevator, social equalizer, et cetera, et cetera. And for that to happen, we have a program and we know that overwhelming majority of French kids graduate 12th, 12th grade with the program, because even when you're in private or confessional school for the school to be able to send their kids to university, they have to be accredited. So you have to follow part of the program. And what do this program? Do? I mean, well, the program follows what Michelet and Brodel and Renan say, which is create and develop an idea of what la personnalité de la France is and have kids be a you know, proud of this personality. Well, that, you know, when the fresco thing happens last year, and I say that this is the fresco to commemorate the evolution of 1794, a very famous journalist at France Culture said, this is another sign that this woman is a militant. She's not a very a good researcher because the abolition was in 1848, duh, because that's what we learn. We learn about Scholcher and we celebrate 1848, and it was in the US that I learned that we are the only country that have to abolition because slavery was abolished in 1794. And then after eight years, they realized that the economy is dying. Like Jean Tular said, the economy needed to be resuscitated. And the only thing way it could happen was to reestablish slavery. But don't worry, nobody complained. Like just millions of people were going back to be slaves, but nobody complained. So education is key. And the thing is now to have all these, to have people who are coming and say, we need to rethink the way we educate French people. I mean, they, the only thing we can do is to call them militant. And the other thing that is happening is that now education is happening in all the firm outside of fora, outside of school, the internet, uh, militant groups, education, and the, the university and the conversation that is happening right now between researchers and militants and activists. And the only reaction that the government can have, which is a natural protection, protecting, self-protecting reaction is to say, these people are, taking all these kids who need answers about, you know, whatever adolescent angst that they have, and they're following these guru-like people who are giving them, you know, energy or bad things to feed their hatred of France. But it's just that the way they were able to control the narrative is not the same anymore because you have all these, you know, alternative way of finding. And when I say alternative, it's good and bad because you have lots of, you know, fake news and etc. But it's just that, and it goes back to your first question, the way the government controlled, and when I say the government, it's not in a complotist way, we're talking about l'éducation nationale, right? Controlled, had a control of the narrative and the way this narrative was anchored in, in you know, the, the, the communication between school and culture, school and the museum. All French kids have to go to the museum. You have to go to the opera. And everything around it creates this extremely solid and cohesive vision of where, who you are. I went to the opera like 20 times, and you know, from kindergarten to opera. I've never seen a black person. It takes been to Dembele to have black bodies in the opera. So all of this is kind of fizzling because the, the this cohesion and the power that you had on the narrative to create one single narrative is coming, is fizzling because people say, hey, we know Otello was black. Don't put black face on Philippe Torreton, put a, a black actor there. So they have to give on this and give on that. And before you know it, because education is happening and the this hegemony of the na Education Nationale is fizzling. And they're going to have to, Saint-Domingue is going to have to be in the books. It's just, I don't see how it's happening. Let's be optimist. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here this evening. A huge thank you to you, Patrick, and to Jacqueline for helping us put together this fantastic month of programming. Um, there'll be more. I mean, I, I will have to work together very soon. So hopefully we'll see you soon. I really urge you 
uh, to go get yourself a copy of this. Um, it's so fantastic. It's just come out earlier this month, right? Second of February, 10 days ago. Um, and it's, uh, we didn't even touch on so much of what's in it. So please go get a copy and then Patrick is going to say a final word. A friendly reminder that the American Library in Paris is a nonprofit organization. We host all of these events for free. We kindly suggest a 10 euro uh, donation per person per event. Um, and thank you in advance. So, um, so buy the book first. Yes, <laughs> buy the book first. And then if you have any money left, then feel free to make a donation. But, thank you uh, all so much. Thank you. Good night. Yeah.